Good morning. The Enlightenment philosopher Immanuel Kant, born 1724, died 1804, was by common consensus one of the greatest philosophers who ever lived. His short book Grundlegung zur Metaphysik der Sitten, in the original German, commonly translated as Groundwork of the Metaphysics of Morals, is one of the undoubted masterpieces in the history of Western moral philosophy. For a brief but very moving sketch of Kant's life, I warmly recommend to you Christine Korsgaard's introduction to your editions of the Groundwork. Since our time together is limited, however, I want to focus today's lecture exclusively on Kant's exciting ideas in the groundwork. Because in addition to being a work of genuine genius, the groundwork is also a fiendishly difficult text, probably the hardest thing we'll read this semester. We've definitely got our work cut out for us today, so let's roll up our sleeves and get started. To help you get your bearings, I want to begin by giving you a bird's eye view of what Kant is up to in section one or chapter one of the groundwork. What is Kant's overall argumentative plan? Well, in section one of the groundwork, Kant executes an audacious philosophical strategy. His aim in this part of the book is to arrive at a view about the form and content of moral obligation. Now, Kant will proceed by deriving a view about what our moral obligation consists in from our ordinary ways of thinking about morality. As he puts it in the preface to the groundwork, his aim in section one is, quote, to proceed analytically from common cognition to the determination of morality's supreme principle. Specifically, Kant will begin from the common intuition that morally good actions, actions done from obligation or duty, have a special kind of value. Kant's core argument in section one of the groundwork proceeds in roughly five stages. I will lay these five stages out for you now at the start of this lecture so that you have an idea of where we are headed. Don't worry if you find this argument hard to grasp at first. We'll spend the rest of today's lecture carefully unpacking and breaking down each of Kant's five main claims. And at the end of the lecture, we will return to this slide and you will be able to measure the progress in your understanding by how much easier you find Kant's argument to follow now. So here then is Kant's argument in Groundwork 1 in a nutshell. The common moral intuition from which Kant starts his argument is that morally good actions have a special kind of value and are indeed unique in possessing this kind of value. A person who does the right thing for the right reasons displays what Kant calls a good will. And section one of the groundwork opens with the claim that a good will is the only thing to which we attribute unconditional value or worth. That is Kant's first key claim. The only thing that has unconditional value or worth is a good will. Kant's second key claim is this. A good will is manifested in actions that are performed with a certain kind of motivation, namely from duty. Now, what sets such actions from duty apart from other actions, both those that are contrary to duty and those that while in accord with duty, are not done from duty and therefore lack genuine moral worth. Is it the purpose or aim of these actions which sets them apart? Not according to Kant. According to him, and this is the third key claim, actions from duty, which have moral worth, are distinguished from other actions, not by their purpose, but by their maxim. Well, what does the maxim of an action done from duty look like? Kant's answer is this, and this is our fourth claim. The maxim of an action from duty has the form of law, that is, it is universal. Therefore, and this is the final step in Kant's argument, the principle of a good will is to do only those actions whose maxims can be conceived as having the form of a universal law. This is one statement of Kant's famous categorical imperative. 
All right, so now that we have a rough idea where we're headed, let's go back to the beginning of the argument and go through the whole thing slowly, step by step. A person who does or tries to do the right thing for the right reasons demonstrate what Kant calls a good will. Section one of the groundwork opens with the claim that a good, good will is the only thing to which we attribute unconditional worth or value. As Kant writes, it is impossible to think of anything at all in the world, or indeed even beyond it, that could be considered good without limitation, except a good will. By the way, in case you're wondering about the numbers behind the quotation, the citation convention for Kant's works refers to the standard Akademie, or Academy edition of his writings in German. The number before the colon designates the volume number. In the case of groundwork, that's volume four of the Academy edition. And the number after the colon is the page number within that volume. All right, so a goodwill is the only thing to which we attribute unconditional worth or value according to common moral cognition. Now, this unconditional value is realized in actions or persons that manifest a goodwill. The goodwill, as Kant puts it, is good because of its volition or willing, which means that it is in actions expressive of a goodwill that we see this special kind of value realized. Now, in saying that a goodwill is the only thing we deem unconditionally valuable, Kant does not mean that the goodwill is the only thing that we value for its own sake as an end. A number of things which Kant says have only conditional value, such as our happiness or our health, are things obviously valued for their own sake. Rather, for Kant, a goodwill is the only thing that is valuable unconditionally. It has its value independently of its relation to other things. Therefore, it has it in all circumstances. External conditions cannot undercut it. So, for example, even if an action from goodwill fails to achieve its purpose, its value as a manifestation of goodwill is not diminished. As Kant writes, a goodwill is not good because of what it effects or accomplishes, because of its fitness to attain some proposed end, but only because of its volition, that is, it is good in itself and regarded for itself, is to be valued incomparably higher than all that could be merely be brought about by it in favor of some inclination, and indeed, if you will, of the sum of all inclinations. Even if this will should wholly lack the capacity to carry out its purpose, if with the greatest effort it should yet achieve nothing and only the good will were left, then, like a jewel, it would still shine by itself as something that has its full worth in itself. All right. So Kant claims that the only thing that uh, is good in itself, that possesses this unconditional value, is a good will. But so far, it's only that, a claim. Now Kant's next move is to present two arguments to back up this claim, that only a good will has unconditional value. The first and more important of these is what we might call Kant's argument by elimination. So according to this argument, there are a number of other things that we value for their own sake, Kant concedes, such as talents of the mind, for example, intelligence or wit, or what he calls qualities of temperament, for example, courage or determination. However, while we value these things for their own sake, their value is not unconditional. There are two reasons for this. For one thing, these things can have their value undercut by being put in the service of an evil will. Personal qualities such as courage or determination are only good when exercised in accordance with a good will. As Kant writes, without the basic principles of a good will, they can become extremely evil. And the coolness of a scoundrel makes him not only far more dangerous, but also immediately more abominable in our eyes than we would have taken him to be without it. Secondly, 
Kant thinks that we do not even take pleasure in the happiness of people if they lack a good will. As he writes, a good will seems to constitute the indispensable condition even of worthiness to be happy. So unlike a utilitarian such as Jeremy Bentham, for whom happiness is both intrinsically and unconditionally valuable, Kant believes that happiness is valuable only conditional on the person who is happy being worthy of happiness in virtue of demonstrating a good will. So there's an important further upshot that follows from this argument by elimination. It is not just that the goodwill is the only unconditionally good thing for Kant. It is also the condition of all other value. Kant's second argument for the claim that a goodwill is the only thing that has unconditional worth or value is specifically directed against the claim that happiness, rather than a goodwill, is the highest good. We can call this Kant's argument from natural teleology, since it rests on the assumption that everything in nature is arranged for a purpose or telos. Now, in the wake of Charles Darwin and the revolution in our scientific understanding that he brought about, this is no longer commonly believed. So Kant's argument here is more of historical interest. But it was an extremely common thought in Kant's day that everything in nature is arranged for a purpose. Specifically, Kant's argument depends on the following claim, quote, In the natural constitution of an organized being, that is, one constituted purposefully for life, we assume as a principle that there will be found in it no instrument for some end other than what is also most appropriate to that end and best adapted to it. All right, so from this principle, Kant then reasons as follows. If happiness were the highest good, an ultimate end of human beings, nature would have ill-equipped us by endowing us with the faculty of practical reason. For reason is not needed to achieve happiness. Instinct might do the trick just as well. Indeed, Kant thinks reason often gets in the way of achieving happiness. As he writes, the more a cultivated reason purposely occupies itself with the enjoyment of life, and with happiness, so much the further does one get away from true satisfaction. And from this there arises in many, and indeed in those who have experimented most with the use of reason, if only they are candid enough to admit it, a certain degree of misology, that is, hatred of reason. For after calculating all the advantages they draw, they find that they have in fact only brought more trouble upon themselves instead of gaining in happiness, end quote. So, Kant concludes, the purpose of practical reason cannot be to make us happy. Rather, it must be to influence the will, specifically to make it good. For that, Kant believes, reason is indispensable. So to summarize, if we assume that everything in nature is arranged for a reason or purpose, this suggests that it is not happiness, but the goodwill, which is the highest good, and happiness is subordinate to the goodwill. Let's move on. Kant has said that the only thing that is unconditionally valuable in itself is a goodwill, and this goodwill is expressed in action. Kant now turns to the question, under what conditions do we attribute goodwill to an action? His next key claim is this. When we attribute unconditional value to an action that evinces goodwill, it is because we have a certain conception of the motives from which the person acted. Christine Korsgaard gives a nice illustration. Imagine a man, she says, who at great personal risk rushes to help a stranger, perhaps even an enemy of his, who's in need. Now, if we conceive of this man as being motivated to help the stranger just because that was the right thing to do, we admire his action. His action evinces goodwill. By contrast, were we to learn that the rescuer acted only to get a reward, say, we'd feel quite differently about his action. We may still be glad that the man performed the rescue, 
but we don't admire him for his action. The action doesn't evince goodwill. So what gives a morally good action its special value for Kant is the motivation behind it, the principle on the basis of which it was chosen, or in Kant's terms, willed. All right, let's briefly take stock and see where Kant will take the argument from here. So we've just seen that what gives a morally good action its special value is the motivation behind it, the principle on the basis of which it was chosen. This implies that once we know how actions with unconditional value are willed, once we know what principle a person acts on when he performs an action that evinces goodwill, we will know what makes this action morally good. And once we know what makes actions morally good, we will be able to determine which actions are morally good. So this will allow us to determine what the moral law tells us to do. So Kant's strategy for the remainder of section one of the groundwork is this. Find out what reason motivates the person of goodwill, so we will know the right reason for doing the right thing. Now, before we can proceed further, we must first briefly pause to take on board some key Kantian terminology. First, we can divide up actions according to whether they are morally permissible or morally wrong. Actions that are morally permissible or right are what Kant calls actions in accordance with duty. Actions that are impermissible or wrong are contrary to duty. But now we can further distinguish amongst actions based on the motivation with which they are performed. So this gives us four action motivation pairs. First, right action done from duty, that is, just because this is the right thing to do. These are the types of actions that, according to Kant, manifest a good will and have unconditional moral worth. Second, right action done from what Kant calls immediate or direct inclination, that is, actions done because the action itself is what I want to do for its own sake. Third, right actions done from what Kant calls immediate or indirect inclination, that is, actions done because this action is useful and serves one of my other ends. Finally, fourth, actions that are contrary to duty. As a matter of fact, Kant thinks that these are done typically because they are useful, that is, from indirect inclination, so like the actions in category three. Okay, so using our new terminology, we can now follow Kant's explanation of what sets actions done from duty, that is, those actions that show goodwill and have genuine moral worth, apart from other types of actions. Actions done from duty, Kant argues, are distinct from actions in categories three and four, that is, actions done from indirect inclination or actions that are contrary to duty, by their purpose. Kant illustrates this point with an example. So he asks us to imagine a shopkeeper who refrains from overcharging even his gullible customers. Now this, for Kant, is an example of an action in category three, that is, an action done from indirect inclination. The shopkeeper acts in accord with duty, to be sure, by not overcharging his customers. However, the reason he does this, Kant assumes, is simply because it is good for his business to have a reputation for honesty. His purpose in not overcharging his customers is an ulterior one, namely to further his business. By contrast, an agent who acts from duty, according to Kant, does the right thing for its own sake. So the intended lesson of the shopkeeper example is this. One difference between doing the right thing from duty and doing it from indirect inclination is this. Someone who is doing the right thing from duty does it for its own sake and not for an ulterior end. So we can say a necessary condition of an action being done from duty is that its purpose be that action itself, not some ulterior end. The action is done for its own sake. However, while this is a necessary condition of an action being done from duty, 
It is not a sufficient condition, as Kant's following examples, the examples of refraining from suicide and the example of the sympathetic person, are intended to show. These are both examples of actions done from immediate inclination, so actions in the second category. An action done from immediate inclination, to remind you, is an action done because you want to do it for its own sake. For example, because you enjoy doing actions of this kind. Let's look more closely at Kant's second illustration, which is referred to in the literature variously as the sympathetic person or the friend of humanity example. Here's how Kant describes this person. Quote, there are people so attuned to compassion that even without another motivating ground of vanity or self-interest, they find an inner gratification in spreading joy around them and can relish the contentment of others insofar as it is their work. Now, a person like this, Kant says, helps others when they are in need. Unlike the prudent shopkeeper, he does so for its own sake. A sympathetic person has no ulterior purpose in helping. He just enjoys spreading joy around him. And yet, According to Kant, even the actions of this friend of humanity who acts from direct inclination to help others lack genuine moral worth. We'll discuss why in just a moment. But first, let's understand the intended lesson of this example. It is this. The difference between the sympathetic person who acts from direct inclination and the person who helps others from the motive of duty does not rest in their purposes, for they have the same purpose in acting, which is to help others. All right, so I bet you're wondering, well, why does the sympathetic person's action lack moral worth, according to Kant? Isn't it admirable to act with the purpose of helping other people? Good question. Let me first give you Kant's answer to this question, and then I'll try and explain it to you. Kant does not deny, of course, that the sympathetic person's action is morally permissible. As he says, it is in accordance with duty and even amiable. And yet, according to Kant, it lacks moral worth. It doesn't evince a good will. Why is that? Kant's answer is this. Though the sympathetic man and the dutiful person share the same purpose in acting, they differ crucially with regard to the maxim of their action. But it is the maxim of action that sets an example done from duty apart from an action done from direct inclination and gives it its moral worth. Okay, but what you ask is a maxim. Again, good question. Let me explain. A maxim for Kant is what he calls a subjective principle of volition which expresses an agent's intended action along with her reasons for performing that action. The agent would state the maxim of her action by saying something like this, I will do act A for reason R. For example, while the sympathetic person and the dutiful agent share the same purpose in acting, namely to help others, their maxims in acting are crucially different. The sympathetic person decides to help others because helping others is something he enjoys. His maxim in acting is, I will help this person because helping others is something I enjoy. By contrast, the person who acts from duty helps others because this is what she understands is what is morally required of her. Her maxim in acting is, I will help this person because that is what I'm morally required to do. For Kant, the reason the sympathetic man's action lacks moral worth is that he chooses to help only because he wants to. But why would that be a problem? Well, even though the sympathetic man's action is in accordance with duty, this alignment is merely fortuitous or accidental. There is nothing in his maxim of action that would stop him from acting contrary to duty if that was what was required in order to do what he enjoys, namely to help others. 
In her essay on the value of acting from the motive of duty, the philosopher Barbara Herman gives a wonderful illustration. So she says, suppose that while going for a walk late at night, the sympathetic person passes by the Museum of Fine Arts. At the back entrance to the museum, he sees two masked men struggling with a heavy burden. Because of his sympathetic temper, the man feels an immediate inclination to help them out. We need not pursue the example to see its point, writes Herman. The class of actions that follow from the inclination to help others is not a subset of the class of right or dutiful actions. In acting from immediate inclination, Herman says, the agent is not concerned with whether his action is morally correct or required. That is why he acts no differently, and in a sense no better, when he saves a drowning child than when he helps the art thieves. Of course, we are happier to see the child saved, and indeed might well prefer to live in a community of sympathetic persons to most others, but the issue remains. The man of sympathetic temper, while concerned with others, is indifferent to morality. In Kant's language, the maxim of his action, the subjective principle on which the agent acts, has no moral content. If we suppose that the only motive the agent has is the desire to help others, then we are imagining someone who would not be concerned with or deterred by the fact that his action is morally wrong. And correspondingly, the moral rightness of an action is no part of what brings him to act." End quote. By contrast, the person who acts from duty helps others precisely because this is what she understands is what is morally required of her. Her maxim in acting is, I will help this person because, because that is what I'm morally required to do. So here, the connection between this agent's maxim and acting in accordance with duty is not merely fortuitous. That is why her action, unlike that of the person acting from immediate inclination, has genuine moral worth for Kant. All right. Now, at this point in the groundwork, Kant makes a rather strange move, which has led to no end of confusion among subsequent generations of his readers. Having presented his example of the sympathetic person, Kant then goes on to modify the example. He imagines the formerly sympathetic man deprived by some personal tragedy of all inclination to help. He writes that if the man nonetheless does the right thing, quote, without any inclination, simply from duty, then the action for the first time has its genuine moral worth, end quote. Now, the point of Kant's remark here is very easy to misunderstand. You might think that Kant is saying, in usual circumstances, the sympathetic man's action lacks moral worth because he has an inclination to help. It is only when a person has no inclination to help that his actions have moral worth. This misunderstanding was already very widespread among Kant's own contemporaries. It is given famous expression in a poem by the German playwright and poet Friedrich Schiller, which mocks Kant's moral philosophy. The poem is divided into a call and a response. So here's the call. Gladly I serve my friends. But alas, I do it with pleasure. Hence, I am plagued with doubt that I'm not a virtuous person. Response. Surely your only resource is to try to despise them entirely, and then with aversion do what your duty enjoins you. Hilarious. Now, the view that Schiller is here mockingly attributing to Kant would, of course, be deeply unattractive. It would imply, for instance, that beneficent actions vis-a-vis -vis our friends could rarely possess genuine moral worth, since friendship almost unavoidably creates in us an inclination to act in ways that benefit the friend. But Schiller's criticism, in fact, rests on a misunderstanding. The real reason why Kant judges the sympathetic man's actions to be without moral worth is not the presence of a natural inclination to help, but rather the way in which this inclination is treated by the agent's maxim, namely as constituting the agent's reason for action. 
The problem with the sympathetic man, according to Kant, is not that he has an inclination to help his friends. Rather, it is that his maxim of action is to do whatever he has an inclination to do, whatever he'll enjoy. The point of imagining the sympathetic man stripped by a personal tragedy of all inclination to help is not, as Friedrich Schiller thought, to make the claim that only in the absence of inclination does a dutiful action have moral worth. Rather, Kant's point is epistemological. Under normal circumstances, Kant thinks, it is often quite hard to know whether someone acted from duty or from direct inclination. After all, while we recognize that helping our friends is something that morality requires, it is also something that many of us have a natural inclination to do. So it is often quite hard to know whether the agent has acted from duty, or rather whether his maxim of action was simply to do what would give him enjoyment. Even in our own case, Kant thinks, we can't always say for sure whether we acted from direct inclination or from the motive of duty. We aren't always completely transparent to ourselves. So it is for this reason that it is useful to imagine a case where someone, due to a personal tragedy, has lost all natural inclination to help others. If an agent who lacks all inclination to do the right thing nevertheless does the right thing, well then we know that he must be acting from duty, that is, with the right kind of maxim. So in this case, we can be sure that his action has moral worth, whereas in cases where there is also an inclination to help others, it would depend on what maxim the agent is acting on. All right. We come now to the final steps of Kant's argument in section one of the groundwork. This, unfortunately, is where Kant's writing is at its most obscure. The prose is very compressed, and reconstructing Kant's argument requires a lot of interpretive work. And to be completely honest, there's quite a bit of disagreement amongst Kant's scholars on how exactly to understand these parts of the argument. With that said, here's my best shot at a reconstruction, following closely Christine Korsgaard. So we've just seen how, for Kant, what gives actions done from duty their moral worth is the agent's maxim in acting. So the next question is, what does the maxim of an action done from duty look like? Kant's answer goes like this. Performing an action because you regard it as morally required is equivalent to thinking of the maxim of the action as a kind of law. The dutiful person takes the maxim of helping others to express or embody a requirement, just as law does. We can put this in Kant's terminology by saying that, for the person who acts from duty, the maxim of helping others has the form of law. But the form of law, according to Kant, is to be universal. The law applies to everyone and does not admit of exceptions. Hence, the maxim of an action from duty has the form of law, that is, it has universal form. To view a maxim as a law, therefore, is to view it as having universal form. Morally worthy actions are actions that are done from respect for law. The dutiful agent is motivated by the fact that his action has a certain form, namely the universal form of law. And from this thought, Kant thinks, we can now proceed to a statement of the supreme principle of morality, Kant's so-called categorical imperative. In acting, the moral agent, the good-willed agent, is moved by the thought that the maxim of his or her action have the form of law, that is, that it have universal form. Hence, the principle of a good-will is to do only those actions whose maxims can be conceived as having the form of a law. In Kant's words, quote, I ought never to act except in such a way that I could also will that my action should become a universal law. This is one formulation of Kant's categorical imperative. Our first lecture next week will be devoted to exploring in detail the various formulations of his categorical imperative 
that Kant goes on to present in section two of the groundwork. But for today, let's return to our opening slide and summarize what we've learned. We've seen that Kant's core argument in section one of the groundwork proceeds through the following five steps. The only thing that has unconditional value or worth is a good will. A good will is manifested in actions that are performed with a certain kind of motivation, namely from duty. Actions from duty, which have moral worth, are distinguished from other actions, which may accord with duty but lack genuine moral worth, not by their purpose, but by their maxim. The maxim of an action from duty has the form of law, that is, it is universal. Therefore, the principle of a good will is to do only those actions whose maxims can be conceived as having the form of a universal law. This is Kant's categorical imperative. I will end with a thinking exercise for you. If you've understood the main points of today's lecture, you should now be able to fill in the blanks in the following table. Please pause your video and spend at least five minutes on this exercise. I've asked all preceptors to go over the answers with you in your next meeting. All right, that's it for today, folks. I look forward to seeing you again next time.